is Al Fong. I'm the owner-operator of Great American Gymnastic Express, but the world knows us as Gage. So I'm also an Olympic coach with my wife, Harmony Barutian. I've always loved gymnastics, but way back when I started, the gymnastics business was non-existent. But I was lucky enough to be in Seattle, Washington at the YMCA with George Lewis. And he was, back then, he was a the man with Dick Mobilehill and they were the leaders of the industry in the United States. I was in that era. That's when I started my gymnastics as a gymnast, but I fell in love with coaching because after my workout at the YMCA, I helped with the girls' gymnastics team, and it kind of evolved from there. See that? You can't do that. Don't do that anymore, because it's on the floor, and if you got, if you got all the milky, pasty chalk on it. If I happen, if, if Teddy happens to stand here like this, ugh, <laughs> right? It's like me going, ah, <laughs> The phone rang in Otillo Gomez's apartment on the night of May 5th. Boxes bound with packing tape stood against the wall. In two weeks, Otillo and Christy planned to load the car and drive up to Missouri. The family, Otillo thought, would soon be together again. Hello, Otillo answered cheerfully. Jalissa had told her the night before how well she had performed on the first day of the competition in Tokyo, and Attila was eager to find out how she had fared on the second day. Mrs. Gomez? It was Al Fong's voice. To this day, Otilla can't remember what Fong told her. But she knows his words registered, because she turned on all the lights, got dressed, called her husband in Missouri, packed her bags, and when it was light, boarded a plane for Japan. Hello, and welcome to my channel. Today we will discuss Al Fong's coaching styles at Gage Gymnastics, otherwise known as the Great American Gymnastics Express. Al Fong opened Gage shortly after being fired from a coaching job in Kansas City in 1979. Al Fong had a vision for Gage, promising parents at his gym that he would hold national gymnasts ranking his gym as one of the best in the nation, <laughs> maybe even in the world. Gage is known for producing many national and Olympic gymnasts. Courtney McCool and Taryn Humphrey were his first Olympians, securing medals at the 2004 Summer Olympics. Ivana Hong, Kara Eaker, Leanne Wong, and Sarah Vinnigan secured alternate spots in recent games. Brenna Dowell and Alina Finnegan made the women's national team. One of his most successful college gymnasts, Lindsey Brown, has received many honors and recognition for MCA in Denver. Now, Fong loves to discuss his current athlete success. I mean, you can see it on any Instagram, recording Kara getting her nails done with his wife, Armin, or having Ali explain on Facebook what the twisties are to those who aren't familiar with gymnastics. Leanne is one of his current success stories, earning fourth at the Olympic trials. He loves her modeling on any merchandise he sells, and Fong will do anything for his girls, even holding grudges at USAG for picking someone else over Brenna for Worlds. But there are some gymnasts that he refuses to discuss. Christy Henrik was Fong's first successful gymnast, as some would say, and you would think that he would praise her work, but this isn't the case. Christy was born in Independence, Missouri, and began training with Fong as a child. She made the national team in 1986, and she placed ninth at the Olympic trials. People believed that her and Fong would be in the 92 Olympics. And Fong described herself as saying, what she lacked in talent, she was able to gain just from sheer work ethic. She was her own worst enemy. If anything, I was constantly pulling on her reins to keep her from hurting herself. Now, gymnastics has always had a reputation for the small, petite little girls averaging in their teen years, and everyone's gone through body criticism for not meeting that reputation. Mary Lou herself has said that when she was criticized by a judge, they said, you know, if I could, I'd take a half a point off just because of that fat hanging off your butt. Some people were able to ignore the criticism. Christy wasn't. Christy could think of little except the weight on her long flight from gymnastics meet in Budapest when she spotted her mother waving by the boarding gate at the Kansas City airport, she didn't say hello. I've got to lose weight, 
she announced. Sandy Henrik looked at her daughter, stunned. A judge told me that I'd never make the Olympic team if I didn't lose weight. Christie's mother describes vividly, in Little Girls in Pretty Boxes, how cruel body negativity can be in gymnastics. And Christie is a prime example of this flaw in USAG. The pressure they put on their top athletes, like Biles, it eventually backfires. And Sean Johnson has admitted to having an eating disorder herself. The critics of her weight made it so hard for her to return to gymnastics in 2011. And although the coach can't be fully responsible for mental health, there have been remarks against Al Fong who encouraged these eating habits. Fong had been telling her that she needed to suck in her gut. Christy recalls Fong once calling her the Pillsbury Doughboy and reminded her frequently about how thin Russian gymnasts looked. Christy stated that when she would lose weight, Fong said she looked great and reinforced her obsession to look thin. She was only 90 pounds. Fong has stated in many interviews that he never called her fat and he doesn't know what the Pillsbury Doughboy is. But it sounds to me like Fong may be refusing to admit to his mistakes. Because other girls at the gym say that Fong would discuss Christie's weight to the public on a regular basis. It was a common topic in the gym. Fong failed to recognize mental health and encourage eating disorders in an effort to prove his gymnastics performance. In the end, it backfired. When I researched Fong, I began to notice that he neglected a lot of his athlete's safety. And a great example of this is sent around Karen and Jalissa. Jalissa Gomez was a successful gymnast who transferred to Gage after stating that she could no longer handle Caroli's abusive coaching methods. Her and Christy became friends at national meets and she was convinced that working with Fong would increase her chances of going to the Olympics. Within months, Al Fong forced Jalissa to compete one of the hardest faults of its time, the Yurchenko. The Yurchenko was introduced by Natalia Yurchenko, a Soviet gymnast in 1983, and the vault was very dangerous. Natalia herself crashed while performing it at Worlds one year, and she cracked both ankles. The vault system was set up differently back then. The gymnastic world was not prepared for this vault, and many people knew it. The vault scared many gymnasts because they couldn't see where their feet were landing on the springboard, and this opened the possibility of overshooting on the board and slipping their feet off on the back. And because they leapt off the springboard backwards blindly, they could easily miss the horse altogether. Jalissa had practiced the vault before, Caroli warning her numerous times that she would miss the springboard someday. Caroli claimed that she did not do well in practices performing this vault. Fong, on the other hand, had stated that Jalissa never missed her feet on the back of the springboard, but he does say that she came close to it a couple times in practice. When the two were at a meet in Japan, Fong was not alarmed when he saw Jalissa struggle on the Yurchenko at warm-ups. She had done well on the first day, and she performed the Yurchenko safely. Safely, as he says. But the videos say otherwise if you look at her in past vaults. When Jalissa competed the Yurchenko, her head didn't clear the top of the horse. She crashed full speed, forehead first, into the side of the horse. Her neck snapped immediately. The force of the vault carried her body over the horse, and she flopped to the mat like a shot bird. Jalissa was taken to a local hospital in Tokyo, instantly becoming a paraplegic. Jalissa was never same again. Her career was over. Uh, what? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's not enough to compete against the Russians or the Romanians, no matter how well you do it. Now, your chenko full is good. If you do it with a double, you'd have a shot at a medal. So we're going to work up to it, bit by bit. Looks like Katie's going to work on her Yurchenko. You scared? Yeah. Because of Dana? Yes. We're going to warm up the vault. There's maybe a dozen girls in the world who compete this vault. You could be one of them in a few months' time. You just got to trust me, OK? OK, let's go. We're going to start with foals. Come on, come on, let's go. We don't have all day.
the hell was that? I don't want to ever see you bail out like- Karen Tannery was another victim. At the Olympic Festival in 87, she messed her hands on a Yurchenko and landed on her head. When she rose, she held her neck and saluted the judges. Moments later, she lay down on the mat, feeling lightheaded. X-rays showed that she had cracked a vertebra in her neck. She was close to being paralyzed. Three months of her career were spent in neck brace. This happened just months after Jalissa had hurt herself performing that same vault. Now, Karen was different because her injury wasn't as severe as Jalissa's, but their story is still the same because both gymnasts had told Fong that they were scared to perform a Yurchenko and refused to train it in practices. Many gymnasts have gotten injuries and become paralegics because the old vault system wasn't designed for harder vaults. Coaches knew this. Still, Fong forced his gymnast to do hard skills because he knew that it had high start values. Fong only cared about one thing, status, his status. He wanted to be known as the most successful coach in America. If this meant that he'd risk injury, that was okay. After all, his gymnasts were doing daredevil skills that some coaches refused to teach. His gymnasts were winning. Maybe not as high as he'd hoped, but in his eyes, he felt like Jalissa and Christie would be the first of his to medal at the upcoming games. But then, things got worse. Jalissa never recovered and went into a coma shortly after her injury. She passed away three years later. Chrissy passed away years later after organ failure from anorexia nervosa. Jalissa's family sued Fong for damages after Jalissa had passed. And Fong was shocked, not just at Jalissa's family who was suing, but Christie's family as well, because they testified at court against him. He had done everything right for Christie, right? I mean, he had kicked her out of the gym. When she became too thin, he kicked her out. He stated that she couldn't do gymnastics until she had gained weight. He did nothing wrong. Well, that's a lie. You see, coaches sometimes tend to get wrapped up in their own bubble, that they fail to register the health of their gymnasts. Christy had shown poor eating habits for months before he even kicked her out of the gym. He had to have known this. Karen and Jalissa stated many times that they were scared to work out in the gym. He knew this. Jalissa talked about Elena all the time. She was her idol. But Fong refused to listen. Fong knew that Elena was forced to do a skill and got hurt. Fong refused to listen to his gymnasts, which included their mental and physical health. Because of this... Some people think he may go down history as the worst coach of USAG history. Some people have other opinions, though. After two of his gymnasts died under his watch, he admits that he took a break from the scene. Some people think of it as an actual break, and others only call it because some of his girls that were doing elite switched down to NCAA levels. Some people even left the gym or retired the sport. Scared of returning, Fong decided to work for after-school programs. That's when Taryn and Courtney arrived, and history was made for him. People began to believe that Fong was now okay, since he had sent two gymnasts to the Olympics in one year alone. He was getting awards for it. He was being recognized. It had been almost a decade since being in the scene, and they thought he had changed. Some people think so, since after marrying Armin. She was a Soviet gymnast herself, who had trained under abusive tactics, and when the two had met and married, Armin told Fong how horrible, how horrible and abusive her coaches were. And he decided to change his ways. Most of his current athletes have not said negative remarks on Fong. Um, Taryn loves sharing her leotard line with Fong, and the pink leotard definitely shows off on Kara's body. The Finnegans love Fong. It's because they've helped their daughter go off to numerous NCAA schools. Aaliyah and Sarah, to name a few. But Ivana has said otherwise. In a gym, Al Fong looks the part of a master motivator, especially through the eyes of a teenage girl. I don't know, I was kind of intimidated by him. Um, I always saw him like at camps when I was really little and just came in with those black gloves and um, bald head. So. 
Intimidated or not, Ivana Hong thought she needed Alphonse tough love to make the Olympics. After all, he coached two silver medalists in 2004, and Ivana appeared to be his next great success story. For four years, she trained under Fong. Then, just months before the Olympic trials, her ankle started hurting. The 15-year-old tried to tell her coach, but he wouldn't listen. They kept telling me that nothing was wrong with my foot, and, like, I knew what was wrong with it, but I wasn't going to be like, you know, I have a fracture in my foot and I'm not going to train. Fong discouraged Ivana from seeking medical treatment. Against his wishes, her mom took her to a doctor who confirmed that she had a fractured ankle. With the Olympics looming, Ivana felt she had no choice but to trudge on. She finished fifth at the Olympic trials, earning an invite to the team's... Ivana was forced to train on injury, something Fong has made a habit of. Christy herself was forced to compete in a meet after breaking her foot days ago in practice. So one is left to believe if Fong has really changed. Aaliyah seems to be very bubbly, but Leanne and Kara seem to be more reserved. It really shows in the interviews and the how-to videos that he posts on Instagram. Kara's family has also said that she is hard on herself, and a clip from USAG shows Alan Armin being pretty stern with her after doing poor on a competition. So, is he really the Cinderella story that USAG so desperately needs? That coaches can turn from evil to good? Has he changed, or has his coaching methods just gotten better over time? I'll let you decide for yourself. For me, I don't have much of an opinion since I've trained at Gage for less than 10 hours of my whole life. I've never seen nor trained under him. I've never seen the Gage girls in person. I will say, though, the gym is pretty nice and it is lively. But I want to believe the good in those, and I have to hope that USAG will change its tactics. Hopefully this series will put a light to that.